Secretary General Antonio Guterres, good to see you and thank you so much for speaking with SABC News. It's a pleasure. The sad and shocking news out of South Africa this week was the passing, the unfortunate passing of Ambassador Zinzi Mandela, the youngest daughter of Winnie Madigizela and Nelson Mandela. Her son Zondwa telling us that while they still await the actual cause of death, that his mother did in fact test positive for COVID-19. I thought we might start there and allow you to say a few words on that. Now I just want to express my deepest condolences uh, to the family uh, but also to the government and people of South Africa. Uh, this was unexpected and untimely. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I believe that uh, South Africa has lost a distinguished diplomat uh, and uh, someone that, of course, is so closely linked to Nelson Mandela uh, and to his life uh, and to his uh, absolutely uh, unique contribution uh, to uh, not only South Africa, but to the world. So it's a moment of uh, sorrow, and uh, I want to fully uh, share uh, the, the sorrow of the South African people uh, in the present moment. SG, interviews of this nature are tricky because we want to tease Saturday's speech but not dilute what will be said. So let's walk this uh, fine line together. You follow in the footsteps of Kofi Annan, Bill Clinton, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Mary Robinson, Barack Obama to mention a few. And yet I struggle to recall a year since this lecture series began in 2003 where a moment in time was so suited to the individual invited to speak. Is this moment built for Antonio Guterres in your capacity as leader of the United Nations? Well, I think that uh, this is a moment where uh, we need more than ever unity and solidarity. And the United Nations must be in the center of uh, pushing the world to come together. We live uh, a dramatic challenge with COVID-19. And unfortunately, uh, the world is not responding in uh, in a united way. We see different countries with different strategies. We see uh, not enough solidarity between the global north and the global south. Uh, we see massive investment of the countries of the north uh, in their economies and societies to uh, be able to uh, go through this dramatic crisis. But we see an enormous difficulty in the, crisis, in the countries of the global south that lack the resources uh, to respond effectively to the pandemic and at the same time the resources to respond to the dramatic impacts in the economy, in the society society in the lives of people. And uh, we need more solidarity, we need more justice, we need more equality in international relations, and the UN must be in the center of the big push in that direction. And that is why the reason of uh, uh, the conference uh, I will be making uh, is on inequality and the absolute need to reduce inequalities in the world, inequalities between the global north and the global south, but inequalities in each one of our societies. You might have answered my next question. You know, the theme of the lecture is, is tackling the inequality pandemic, a new social contract for a new era. What exactly does that mean to you? Well, if one sees uh, our societies, it is true that our societies today are fragmented. It is true that there is a lack of trust between uh, political establishments and people. And it is true that uh, uh, there is huge inequality at all aspects, not only income inequality, but inequalities of gender, of, of, of race, of ethnicity, uh, in relation to minorities, indigenous peoples, uh, in relation to uh, the capacity to go through this dramatic uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, uh, what uh, I believe is that we need to address this uh, uh, gap, uh, that inequality, this fragility that inequality has created in our societies. And uh, uh, this, uh, today there is a consensus that inequality is an obstacle to development. Inequality is a generator of social unrest. It's a threat to peace and security. And inequality is one of the fragilities we need to overcome if we want to respond to the COVID-19 effectively, if you want to address climate change, if you want to address all the challenges that our societies and our world face today. It's also a threat to women, I'm sure you'll agree, based on the inequality you find in the home as well, uh, SG. And for that, uh, as I said, we need a social contract in the sense that we need governments and people to come together uh, with the civil society, with the businesses, and to have uh, a more sustainable and inclusive development, to have uh, an emphasis on education and digital literacy as the big enablers, to have uh, a new generation of social policies and safety nets uh, like universal health coverage, uh, and at the same time to bring this feeling 
to the homes. Because we see, uh, unfortunately, that uh, with the lockdowns, with all the problems that uh, were created by the pandemic, we have seen an increase in family violence. And uh, this increase in family violence uh, is a tragedy that we need to be able to overcome. And we need to have, of course, I ask for a global peace. Uh, in the world uh, um, uh, to face the pandemic, a global ceasefire. I think we also need to have peace in our homes and uh, to make sure that family violence is reduced and that uh, governments help the victims in order to make sure that they can uh, overcome uh, the enormous challenge that uh, this uh, uh, situation is creating. And it's understandable because people are uh, disquiet, people are afraid, people are um, in, in uh, the situation, is, there is a global turmoil Oil. So, uh, in mental health is being impacted, and so unfortunately, uh, we see this uh, increase of violence in many of the homes uh, around the world. Madiba's was a fight against racial injustice and for dignity, something that confronts us today, against inequality, something the coronavirus has really laid bare in so many ways, against poverty that is being exacerbated by short-sighted corruption and greed. He fought against patri patriarchy and for peace, and yet that too is also a luxury for a few, SG. So while we have this diagnosis, why are the remedies so hard to come by? No, I... These questions are not questions just for a few. This, I mean, racism is impacting uh, the, the whole world population. Uh, patriarchy is, in, is impacting negatively women everywhere in the world. And to deal with those issues is today something that mobilizes uh, um, crowds everywhere. I mean, uh, one of the things that makes me be hopeful in relation to the future is see the social movements, people uh, with loud voices uh, asking for justice uh, in relation to racism, asking for equality, uh, gender equality uh, uh, in the world, asking, uh, uh, fighting against forms of violence against women, but also the kind of violence that uh, we have seen uh, in uh, the uh, recent uh, uh, racist uh, uh, motivated attacks uh, around the world. So uh, it, it is clear that these are concerns that are concerns of us all, and we need to mobilize the whole world to fight racism, to fight inequality, to fight uh, populism, to fight uh, uh, patriarchy, uh, and to uh, address the challenges uh, that uh, we face in order to have a more inclusive and sustainable development. So are you talking then about a ground-up approach? You talk about the social movements, the protest movements. Do we remedy these global ills from the ground up or from the top down? I think we need both. But it is clear that uh, today we see more movement in climate change, uh, in uh, gender uh, issues. We see more movement uh, in the civil society, uh, in the youth, than uh, in uh, political leaders. And it is very important that political leaders understand that these are moments in which fundamental decisions need to be taken. And now that we are facing uh, uh, the COVID-19 and we will need to build back, that we need to build back differently. It doesn't make sense to reproduce what we had in the past. We need to address the fragilities of inequality, of uh, uh, climate change, uh, of uh, the lawlessness in the cyberspace. We need to have a more inclusive and sustainable world. And for that, we need to build back better. And uh, uh, the peoples in the world are asking for that. Political leaders need to be able to respond. We need, as I say, top down and also grassroots movements to push in the same direction. And then find each other in the middle. Uh, sir, I know you will speak to the legacy of colonialism and patriarchy and how current power structures in the international framework to this day continue uh, a different form of colonialism that perpetuates inequality and injustice. Give us a sense of your thinking around this and of course something you will elucidate further on Saturday. Well, colonialism uh, has, of course, been uh, a, a terrible uh, event uh, uh, with uh, uh, terrible consequences. Uh, but uh, uh, we had a wave of decolonization after the Second World War, and the UN was strongly involved in it. But many of the problems generated by colonialism, and uh, of course we can remember the awful tragedy and the awful crime of uh, uh, the slave uh, trade through the Atlantic. Uh, uh, we can see legacies like the apartheid and, and many other aspects. But the, the problem is that we still inherited in today's world 
things that come from colonial relations. For instance, uh, uh, many of the countries that were colonized are still struggling with their economies to go up the supply chain because they still are condemned uh, to live based on uh, uh, the exploitation of raw materials and uh, low-tech goods. Uh, so uh, uh, there is a need to change international relations in order for these countries to be able to catch up. And uh, at the same time, we need to fight racism everywhere. Uh, because racism is undermining the cohesion of societies, not only in the developing world, but also and particularly in the developed world. And we need to fight uh, uh, populism. We need to fight uh, nationalism. We need to fight all the things that are separating, scapegoating. You see how migrants and refugees are sometimes scapegoated in relation to problems of which they are victims, uh, not uh, the cause. So uh, it, it, is, it is clear that we need to look back to look into our past, to look into the mistakes committed in the past, to see what still needs to be corrected, and to reflect seriously on how to build a world of social cohesion and a world of equality and mutual respect. I mean, I could tell you a few things that need to be uh, corrected. You know, the lack of reforms of institutions like the Security Council, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and others. Uh, these appear, you know, these lack of reforms appear as intransigent as ever. In this is this an arena or an area you, as Secretary General, could give more voice to? Uh, I know, you know, essentially that this will be a decision for member states when we talk about reform of the Security Council, but this is this not a drum you should be beating in your office on a daily basis? This is something that is very important in my perspective. Uh, equality must come from the top and come from equality at level of global institutions. Now, the fact that if you look at the African continent, Africa was a victim of colonialism first because of colonialism itself. But then, as most of the institutions that we have today were created after the Second World War, this was a time where most of the African countries were not independent. And so Africa is underrepresented. And the global south is, in general, underrepresented in international institutions. And this is particularly true in relation to composition and voting rights, not only in the Security Council, but as you mentioned, in the Bretton Woods institutions. And one of the things I do believe is that uh, to have equal participation in the world and to have stronger voice of the developing world is a fundamental element in order to have more justice, more fairness, less inequality in uh, international relations and uh, in the lives of people in general. A few more questions before I let you go. How have you prepared for the speech? In particular, how have you linked the examples of Nelson Mandela to what you plan to say on Saturday? Well, Nelson Mandela is a fantastic inspiration uh, in all aspects. Uh, first of all, uh, he fought for inequality in a dramatic way uh, because he was uh, uh, living in one of the most unequal societies, not only economically, but politically and racially. Uh, and uh, he, 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 it is remarkable. I mean, I was uh, last year in my holidays in Robin Island uh, in his cell and looking uh, through the bars and, I mean, living what it is absolutely amazing in the life of a man that having been 18 years there and many others uh, in other prisons was able to unite, to forgive and to create a completely new society and to be an example for everybody in the world. So he has been an enormous inspiration in, for the UN. And when we developed our strategy that we are presenting in relation to fighting inequality in the world, Nelson Mandela is a fundamental source of inspiration. So I know you've met him a few times. I mean, what did you talk about? Well, uh, I, I remember the first two meetings we had. The first was uh, in a mission I had with Pierre Mauroy to South Africa uh, after his release, uh, but when the clerk was still president. Uh, and um, uh, we were there to support uh, the transition, to support the ANC at the time. And I was amazed by um, the way he expressed himself. I was expecting naturally, even if I knew uh, many of the fantastic things that he represented, but I was expecting some anger. I was expecting some, uh, I mean, th th this feeling of... Uh, uh, Resentment. Resentment. And it was, on the contrary, uh, uh, compassion, forgiveness, uh, this sense of unity. Oh, absolutely amazing. It was one of the most emotional moments of my life. And then uh, he came to Lisbon. Um, at the time, I was leader of my party. We had a meeting, uh, an international meeting, in which he addressed uh, the meeting. And he appealed for international presence in the elections in South Africa that would take place uh, uh, very soon after that. And again, uh, he, he was someone that everybody, and there was people from all over the world, 
everybody was looking like a fantastic source of inspiration, a model. Uh, if we could have Nelson Mandela example and policies everywhere in the world, the world would be very different and we would be much better fighting COVID to today. So when all is said and done on Saturday, SG, what do you hope this speech leaves those that hear it with? What do you want to see the next day? What should happen next? I think that it's important that people feel the sense of urgency to be active, to be active as citizens, to be active as business leaders, to be active as leaders of the civil society, as young people, as political leaders. As voters. As voters, to understand that now that we had this tragedy, we need first to try to correct the injustice that is prevailing in the way the world is responding, because the North has not been sufficiently in solidarity with the South, but at the same time that we need to create the conditions to build up better, to address at the same time the inequalities and fragilities of our society, to be able to shift resources from the grey economy to the green economy, to think about our future generations, and at the same time to look into the social protection systems, into universal health coverage, into mental health, into a new uh, generation of safety nets to protect people, um, and to look into racial uh, relations, to look into uh, protection of indigenous peoples, to look into uh, gender, to look into all the other aspects that still create enormous injustice in the world and address them with a sense of urgency and of priority that is still lacking in today's world. And the COVID must be the pretext to do it because the COVID has shown how fragile we are. And if we want to correct our fragilities, we need to address all these problems. Some would say that this is really a speech more for socialism, greater socialism in the world, and perhaps more against the free market principles that have tended to dominate it. Would that be a fair analysis? I don't think so. This is about values, and values that I believe are today universal. And even in a pragmatic point of view, if you talk, if you talk about economic policy, it is true that in the past, uh, several economists in a more conservative approach would think that inequality was a positive element in the generation of wealth and that, of course, afterwards everybody would benefit. Today, all economists recognize that inequality is an obstacle to development, that inequality creates situations that are a, a, a problem uh, for the development even of the markets, uh, of the market economy. So today, I think there is a consensus from left to right, that we must address inequality if you want to have prosperity for all. Always good to see you, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres will deliver this year's Nelson Mandela Lecture virtually from New York, Saturday, 3 p.m. in South Africa, 9 a.m. in New York.